Hey folks, so I recently got a good question from a subscriber about when to use cleat wedges. So that's what we're gonna go over today. Now these wedges, and they come in different varieties, this is for look cleats or speed play, uh, four bolt or some two bolt cleats too. Their job is to uh, correct some um, issues that are specific to the feet. Um, that is most of the time the case, not 100% of the time, but almost all the time. If you're using one of these, it should be because there is some mechanical issue occurring at the feet. And this is why a bike fit has to include an off the bike assessment, because if you don't know where a certain motion is coming from, for, like for instance, a, a, an aberrant knee motion, I've seen a lot of people come in with wedges underneath their cleats, trying to correct for some knee motion when that motion isn't coming from the, the feet at all. And so the wedges themselves are not gonna do much of any good. Um, it should, the, the, the wedges should be used only when the forefoot mechanics are causing some aberrant motion. The most common and the simplest example of this is when we have what's called forefoot varus. Now forefoot varus is really common. It's a, it's a, it's a posture position, you might say, um, of the forefoot and the forefoot being, I'm gonna use my hands as feet again as I did in old videos, but um, this is my right foot, here's my big toe. Um, we have the, the toes or, and then we have metatarsals, okay? Um, Forefoot varus just means that the forefoot, the metatarsals and the toes themselves, like to sit in this orientation where the big toe is oriented up in a non-weight bearing or, un, or unweighted position. And where there's a way we test for this, we have somebody kneel um, and with their feet dangling off of the uh, bed surface and uh, it allows us then to kind of see where the forefoot will naturally go to and hang, okay? Now, m much of the population has some degree of forefoot varus. It is much more common than the opposite, which would be forefoot valgus, which is the bottoms of the feet pointing away from each other. However, not that many people, when they ride a bike, does it become an issue. Um, but when it does, this is, this is what ha ends up happening is, we have the, the bottom of our shoe, and so let's, this is an insole here, so let's just pretend this is inside of our shoe. And our foot, instead of wanting to rest flat on it, it wants to, of course, rest with the big toe oriented up just a little bit with the forefoot at an angle. So then when we go to push down on the pedals, in order to complete our pedal stroke and get the most out of our pedal stroke, we have to finish through the first ray or the, the, the big toe and its metatarsal. And so that, that forefoot will have to then collapse down to the shoe to meet it. Um, you can almost think of it as it's not pronation, but you can almost think of it that way. We sort of have to, that foot has to pronate in to, uh, to then meet the bottom of the shoe so we can finish the force through that big toe on the inside here. Because that's how the, po the power transfer goes. It go starts from kind of the back and the side and it, as we push on the pedals, it then transfers through the first ray and finishes at the bottom of the pedal stroke there. What this can do is if that foot does have to travel like that, you can imagine if that foot is moving, then it's gonna have, to, it, it has a potential anyway to drive the knee in and do, do all sorts of other things. Um, and that can cause, obviously it can cause some problems on people. So the purpose of the wedges is to correct for that. And I'm gonna, okay, so the way these work, and we'll see if we can get this secondary camera here to work. So we have these wedges here. And what I can do is they have a thin side and a thick side. And what I'll do is I'll stack a couple of them together like that. So the fat side is, is over here on this side and then the thins, the, this is the thin edge. And what I can do then is because my foot inside the shoe wants to rest like that with the, with the big toe angled up, right? What I can do is I can take these wedges and put the fat side underneath the cleat. And of course, this is the wrong, uh, this is the wrong style for this cleat, but you get, you'll get the idea. It's easier to see these big yellow wedges. Um, it will, when it's put underneath that cleat, it will angle that cleat down like that. So the sh with, with the shoe tipped up like that, it'll angle the cleat down. And that directly affects then because, uh, affects us because now if you have a forefoot varus, your foot can assume some of this posture and what we're doing then is we're just bringing the cleat down to meet the pedal. 
in a flat orientation the way it has to because that cleat, the only way it's going to engage is in that flat orientation. And that's a good way to go about it. It's not always the best way. It's really simple though, because we can, again, these are the ones for the SPDs. These can easily be slipped underneath a cleat and, uh, and you can have an impact. However, sometimes a better fix for that is to actually adjust the insole. We can, since again, my foot wants to orient like this, what we can do is bring the insole up to meet that, okay? And so what we would end up doing is building up all this inside here to kind of orient the forefoot in this way. And so now the foot can orient at the position that it wants to, wants to stay in here. Um, this then is built up to meet the bottom of the shoe, and then we can transfer power to the bottom of the shoe through the pedal in a flat orientation to the, to the, from the cleat to the pedal. Um, the difficulty with doing that when, in some instances is if you have a, an existing pair of shoes already, building that up, and obviously it's not, never built up that much or rarely, um, it's usually mild, but it still takes up more space. And usually most, you know, many cycling shoes are, are fairly low volume already. And so there's just not a whole lot of room in there. Um, so that's the simplest and most common way that this all happens. Um, you can actually have a, you can actually have a, um, a measurable forefoot varus position um, with your fit and it can, you can have no trouble whatsoever. So these, you really shouldn't do this preemptively in necessarily. Um, I wouldn't, te you know, do a test and see that you have four foot varus and automatically put shims in or wedges in, excuse me. And, uh, and so this is the kind of thing that we do want to take one step at a time and just see if, if there actually is a problem first. Now these wedges can be used with other um, mechanical issues with the feet, but it's definitely more rare. This is probably the most common reason to use them. Um, and even more rare is using them for outside reasons. You know, um, something having to do with the knee or the hip. It can be sometimes mildly effective, but generally you're, you know, you're trying to correct, um, you're trying to correct something by pushing or pulling on the wrong, on the wrong joint. I see a lot of people come in with some very sort of tortured um, uh, cleat orientations where they have multiple uh, multiple wedges and one side is pushed one way and one is pushed the other and it can get you know in a, in a lot of these situations um, these are in really entirely unnecessary um, and unfortunately I think it's because you know these these wedges as simple as they are they they sort of convey a bit of uh, um, of mystery, you know, perhaps that the, the fitter knows something that you don't know and uh, that they're doing these minute changes and, and that's going to help you. And um, in a lot of cases I've found, not all of them, but in a lot of cases if people come in with a lot of adjustment and it's really been not terribly necessary. So there, that brings me to some of our rules for using these wedges. And the first rule re relates back to what I just said. So the first rule is that you want to use as, as little as you have to. Um, it's going to, so it goes back to that minimum effective dose that, that we want to apply with our bike fitting. We, you know, by overdoing it, you're, you're, you're not solving it. You actually could be creating more problems. The next rule is, is that one-sided solutions, meaning we're just wedging one side, are actually fairly common. We don't necessarily, this is not a tit-for-tat sort of situation. We don't have to wedge both sides. When it's necessary, wedging both sides can be very effective but I found probably more than, just slightly more than half the time, we only need to wedge one side. And something that's really interesting, this is kind of the third rule to understand, is that the wedging is not always permanent. Just because we put these under and, and, it, and, it, uh, and it helps with, um, with uh, some, you know, some knee motion because it's con helping to control forefoot varus, it doesn't necessarily mean it's, it has to be left in there forever. And, and it's not because our forefoot varus goes away, it's because we have two different types of, of uh, problems when we're, when we're dealing with this motion that creates you know, aberrant knee movement or aberrant hip movement, something else. And uh, we, have, we have dynamic problems and we have structural problems. Now the structural problems are often the case where these will stay in potentially forever, not necessarily, but potentially, but usually they, they'll, they'll just live there. And, and that's fine. And it's not a big deal to transfer from one set of cleats to another and new shoes, etc. But we want to be aware that there are dynamic issues at play here too. Meaning someone may have a forefoot varus, but again, as I mentioned, many people don't show 
um, any symptoms for that. And so I have had a number of people where they've come in and they end up having not a structural issue, but a dynamic issue. And so we put wedges in, they, it helps clean up some motion, they ride with it. And usually though, this takes anywhere from months to maybe a year or more, but it still does happen. And what we're able to do is remove them and the person's motion is maintained. They actually have, still have really good motion in there. And the reason for this is because it's a dynamic problem, what we often end up doing is that the wedge helps correct for some motion, which then allows us to develop sort of a new motor plan. It essentially allows us, uh, the body to, for lack of a better way of putting it, allows it to learn how it should be postured, how it should be moving through the pedal stroke. Over time, we ingrain this new pattern and now, because it now has better motor control, it's not relying on structural control. It has better motor control, dynamic control. Now we can remove the, you know, ostensibly what was a crutch or a temporary crutch, and that motor plant is still in place. And I've had many people where we've, you know, they've come back for a checkup six months or a year later um, with, you know, no issues. And what we've done is tested them. We see that, yep, your motion still looks really good. And then we actually take the, the wedge out and sure enough, we retest them and retest them and retest them. And sure enough, their motion stays good even without them. Now, the only way to really know whether you have a, um, something that can be, um, is structural or dynamic, um, that's difficult. Again, that goes back to, to, some, to some extent, it might be on the off the bike assessment. So that's why, again, those are really necessary. But what it really requires in the bike fit is you have to have extremely accurate technology to measure because we, we don't have a lot of leeway. We're, we're, we're really tracking down minute movements most of the time. And so if you have no way to measure, um, you know, some, some, you know, very tiny motions in the knee or the hip, then you're not going to be able to tell uh, to any significant degree of confidence that this person's motion has improved and that they no longer need these, these wedges. Um, so that's part of the that's part of the, the the rub there is that in order to do that you really have to have uh, have sort of the data really locked down and, and have it tightly controlled. Now, as I mentioned, a lot of times shoes are built with this forefoot positioning, forefoot uh, varus position posturing in there, and so you do need to be careful when you are then going from say an, uh, one shoe to an, to the next. I have had clients where they've even stayed with the same manufacturer, but the manufacturer changed the way the, the forefoot is posted in the shoe. And uh, we've had to sort of redo a bit of the, um, of the uh, wedging solution. Sometimes we've been able to remove it because they added some in. Um, but that's, uh, that's something definitely to be aware of. So I hope this was helpful to some out there. Um, I'm sure in a lot of situations, we probably gave you more questions than answers. Uh, but uh, at least if it gets you, gets you thinking, gets you questioning kind of how things are set up, um, you might, uh, might come to some solutions for your own bike fit. Um, if you do have uh, further questions, don't hesitate to put them in the comments below and I will get to those. And uh, thank you to my subscriber who asked this question. This is, you know, this is what I do often is I will just, when, when people ask questions, many times if it's, if it's really good, I will just do a quick video on it. So thank you again and uh, we'll see you next time.